We welcome you to our session on geopolitics. We're very pleased to have with us two distinguished guests, Robert Kaplan from the Eurasia Group and Kishore Mahobani, Professor, National University of Singapore. Um, Robert Kaplan, in detail, is Managing Director and Expert, Global Macro Politics at Eurasia. Kishore Mahobani is Distinguished Fellow, Asia Research Institute at the National University here in Singapore. Uh, we will first start with opening remarks. Uh, Robert Kaplan will go first and speak for about 10 minutes, followed by Kishore Mahobani. Well, it's a great privilege and pleasure to be here with all of you today, if it's, even though it's only virtual. Um, anyway, I'm just going to dive right into it and talk about the United States and China. First of all, in the, in the June 2005 cover of The Atlantic, I wrote a, a cover story about how we would be having in the future a Cold War with China. People were enraged by the peace, but, you know, but, but so I've been thinking about this for 15 years already. Um, it's a Cold War for very simple reasons. The United States and China compete in a wide, of in a wide array of issues um, across the gamut very seriously, but neither side sees it even remotely in its self-interest to have a shooting war. Therefore, it is a Cold War in the lower case sense of the term, of course, much, much different than the Cold War the United States had with the Soviets. Here are the issues that are basically unsolvable. One is um, the United States and China have absolutely diametrically opposed ambitions and goals in the South and East China Sea. In the South, um, um, for, for China, the South China Sea is absolutely critical to control in order to allow China easy access to its growing Indian Ocean maritime empire through the Straits of Malacca and other straits. It's, it's like the British East India Company in reverse what China is building. It's going from the South China Sea clear across the Indian Ocean up the Red Sea to the central Mediterranean. And all along that route, the Chinese are building ports or helping to finance ports. From the United States point of view, the United States, especially the Pentagon sees this, the United States is a Pacific power, as if it were, if it, as if it were actually located in East Asia. The legacy of World War II, of Vietnam, Korea, um, of, the, of the occupation of the Philippines, and so much, so much more. Neither side is willing to budge an inch. And it's the same with the East China Sea. Um, but as I said, neither side sees it in its self-interest to have a shooting incident. If an incident would happen, it, we, um, issues of status would come in in a global media age, and both sides might find it very hard to back down. We've seen a number of major wars in the Middle East. They have not affected financial markets at all. Any kind of a conflict in the South or East China Sea would seriously affect financial markets. Then we go to cyber. Cyber is a destabilizing element for the U.S.-China relationship. The, China, we, the United States and China have for some years been in a hot cyber war already. The Chinese have successfully hacked into uh, the U.S. Navy ship maintenance records, the Pentagon's personnel system. U.S. Cyber Command is poised to launch retaliatory strikes. Um, cyber is bad news for the U.S.-China relationship. Trade, you know all about. I don't need to go into that. If President if but Vice President Biden were to be elected president, he would downplay the trade issue, but he would upgrade the human rights disagreements that China has with the Turkic Uyghur Muslims, the Tibetans, and the people of Hong Kong. Um, then there's ideology. For a third of a century, um, the United States was comfortable with China's uh, system. It was enlightened benign, collegial, technocratic authoritarianism. That was fine as far as the U.S. business roundtable was concerned. But the Chinese system, as we all know, has evolved. It's evolved into more of a one-man personality cult or repress, um, repressive kind of regime. And the result of that is that China has no more friends in Washington, no friends in the media, no friends in Congress, 
um, no fr- and not many friends among the Democrats. Because remember, the left wing Democrats dislike China for the same reason that the right wing Republicans do. Because uh, because the feeling is from the from the extremes of the U.S. that the Chinese the Chinese regime has been in effect stealing American jobs. Um, we have an election coming up in the United States in November. In November, China will be an issue in that election. Um, And each side, Trump and Biden, will compete with each other to show who can be tougher on China. So the very democratic process in the United States is like cyber, will further destabilize the U.S.-China relationship. Um, President Donald Trump has been a gift to China. Um, because he tore up the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, so that the United States has no overarching vision for Asia and Eurasia. TPP would have encompassed trade, uh, democracy building, military alliance structure. All that is gone. Uh, Trump has been a transactor in Asia, not an alliance leader. And that leaves the field wide open for China's Belt and Road Initiative with all of its problems and all of its difficulties. It has no competitor at the moment. The Chinese at least have a vision. The Americans at this point do not. Um, Then there's uh, Trump has played loose and fast with the U.S.-Japanese Treaty Alliance. He's given the Japanese much to worry about in terms of whether the U.S. nuclear umbrella is there forever for Japan. And the U.S.-Japanese Treaty Alliance is what anchors the security of Asia and what allows Asia to just ignore strategic issues and just make money for the world economy. Because it's a natural, elegant balancer to the um, to the rise of China, the U.S.-Japan relationship. And it's been weakened by President Trump. Then there's the Japanese-South Korean trade dispute, which never should have happened because they're both strong allies, strong treaty allies with the United States. And in any other administration, they would have, in a heartbeat, sent an assistant secretary of state for East Asia to engage in shuttle diplomacy between Seoul and Tokyo in order to solve that thing in a second. It was not done under the Trump administration. Um, However, I've got news for you. If, um, if, If Vice President Biden is elected president in November, the atmospherics will improve greatly. But the basic problems that I've outlined in the U.S.-China relationship will remain, and you'll be surprised to see how tough a a democratic administration will be, because I know all the people that they will appoint, that Biden will appoint in the Asia portfolios, in the Pentagon, in the um, in the State Department, at the National Security Council, etc. And all of these people, they're all moderate Democrats who over the past decade have become increasingly hard line against China. So what I'm saying is that there's no daylight, really. Um, and then, um, however, at the end, at the end of the day, what will determine the ultimate outcome of the U.S.-China lowercase cold war? It will be internal developments in the, in the United States and in China itself. Whichever system internally is able to be more robust, is able to get over its problems and reinvent itself, that is the system that will ultimately prevail. And we could go into detail about all the internal problems of China and all the internal problems of the United States. Um, uh, The United States internal problems are less opaque, better reported on than the internal problems in China, but the problems internally in China are there nevertheless. So I think that what people have to get used to, what they have to get their you know, heads around, is that, the, you know, is that the great power rivalry, we're entering a period of fractured globalization, fractured along the lines of US-China with Russia as an asterisk, so to speak. 
um, in this. And this second wave of globalization, this globalization 2.0, is not going to be as friendly to optimistic scenarios as the first wave globalization 1.0 was when it, it bred a whole elite global elite class of optimists it's going to you know it's going to be fractured um, supply chains are going to separate not completely that's been overstated a bit vietnam is not going to lock stock and barrel replace china to um, uh, to make uh, us goods but the, but it will separate out and that will give us businesses less of a naked self interest to be sympathetic to China. So it's, it's a worrisome scenario, but I can end with this positive note. Each side will do everything it can to avoid a hot war, to avoid an incident. Um, um, you know, they will try to set, and in a Biden administration to close up, I'll say that you would have rules of the roads established. In other words, we'll agree, we'll agree on what we can disagree on. We'll have regular summit meetings. It'll be much more orchestrated. And yet the difficulty, the rivalry will go on and on. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure uh, to join you for this Asian Insights Conference at DBS. Let me say this conference could not be more timely because we are all clearly in the middle of a major geopolitical contest that has broken out between the United States and China. And I agree with Robert Kaplan when he said that this is a new Cold War with a lower KC. But I want to emphasize that the perspective I'll give you will be somewhat different from Kaplan's. Because in any geopolitical contest, it's a mistake to think that one side is right and one side is wrong. There are always different perspectives. So what I propose to do today is answer three questions. First, why did this conflict break out? Second, who will win? And three, how will other countries choose? Let me begin by asking, why did this contest break out? And here I want to emphasize, it's not driven by personalities. Forget Trump, forget Biden. It's driven, driven by deep structural forces. And let me mention three. Firstly, for over 2,000 years, whenever the world's number one emerging power, which today is China, is about to overtake the world's number one power, which today is the United States of America, the world's number one power always tries to push down the world's number one emerging power. So what's happening between the United States and China is now following a 2,000-year logic, which actually Graham Allison has spoken about in his book, uh, Destined for War. And then, but the second structural force is something that virtually no Americans and no Westerners speak about, which is that there is a subconscious, emotional dimension that is also driving this US-China geopolitical contest. And this subconscious dimension, which is actually politically incorrect, is mentioned in, in Western political circles, is that there has always been in the West a fear of the yellow peril. It's been there since the Mongols almost invaded uh, Europe. And it's still there. In fact, at the end of the 19th century, the United States passed the Racial Exclusion Act to keep out Chinese. So it's, it's a real factor. And I, and I mentioned that because it explains the emotional dimension that is also at play in the US-China geopolitical contest. And the third structural factor is the fact that the United States, on both sides of the aisle, the Republicans and Democrats, and I agree here with Robert Kaplan, the Republicans and Democrats are united on this contest against China, that both sides believed that when the United States engaged China, when the United States opened up China's economy, after opening up China's economy, China's political system would open up, China would become liberal democracy like America, and China and America would live happily ever after. That was the expectation. Of course, you can say it was an unrealistic expectation because how is it that a young republic like the United States, which is less than 250 years old, Assume that when it interacted with a 4,000-year civilization with four times the population, the United States would change China 
rather than the, uh, China change the United States. But it's important to understand the mindset of the Americans in their belief of this. So we can see this is driven by deep structural forces. So my next question is, who will win? And let me begin by emphasizing that for most Americans, this question doesn't even arise. Americans assume, of course, America is going to win. And it's, it's fair to say that America has had 100 years of triumph. It's won every contest it took part in. World War I, World War II, the economic contest with Japan, the Cold War against Soviet Union. The United States got used to winning after 100 years. The idea, the question, can America lose, is actually impossible to us in, in America. And that's why I wrote my book called, Has China Won? to at least pose the question, is it conceivable that China can win? And surely common sense will tell you that surely that is a possibility. But let me explain why the Americans cannot even conceive of that possibility. Because they believe in a contest within a democracy and a dictatorship, which is what they call the Chinese system, the democracies will always win. And I want to emphasize uh, that the United States is still by far a much stronger country than China. And if the Chinese underestimated the United States, it would be a huge and indeed a fatal mistake to make. Never, never underestimate the United States. And Winston Churchill once famously said, you can always count on the United States to do the right thing after it has explored all other options. So even though the United States has made mistakes, and I'll speak about them, you must never underestimate the capacity of the United States to win this contest. But at the same time, the biggest strategic mistake that the United States has made in dealing with China is that it has not worked out a comprehensive long-term strategy before taking on China. And the man who gave me this insight was probably, is probably America's greatest living strategic thinker, Henry Kissinger, at a one-on-one -on -one lunch in uh, New York in March 2018. That was the message he gave me, and he allowed, it to, he allowed me to put it inside my book too. And I can tell you that that's a serious mistake, because if the United States doesn't even look at its own strategic weaknesses, then it's going to face a real problem. And I agree with Robert Kaplan. When he said at the end of the day, it's not about guns and bombs or who's got the stronger military. It's about which society is more dynamic and more vibrant in this contest. The Americans assume that their society is more dynamic, more vibrant. But the evidence suggests otherwise. America is the only major developed country where the average income of the bottom 50%, 50 percent, five zero percent, has gone down over a 30-year period, creating what two Princeton University economists, Case and Deaton, have said is a sea of despair among the white working classes. And this sea of despair, this unhappiness, is what explains the election of Donald Trump in 2016. By contrast, if you look at China and, and the, the well-being of the Chinese people, the Chinese people have just enjoyed the greatest improvement in the standard of living in the past 40 years. And indeed, the past 40 years have been the best 40 years in 4,000 years of Chinese history. So here you have a civilization bouncing back with great force and the United States a troubled society. And yet the possibility that the United States may lose just doesn't even emerge in American thinking. And that's why my book is also a gift to the Americans to say, think twice, look at the big picture, and think carefully before you march straight ahead into this geopolitical contest. So let me conclude briefly by talking about how will other countries choose. And unlike the first Cold War, which the United States had with the Soviet Union, where many, many allies enthusiastically joined the United States. Europe certainly joined the United States. Japan joined the United States. Major third world developing countries, you know, Egypt, uh, Pakistan, Indonesia, all joined the United States. But this time around, you notice that while clearly more countries appear to be more sympathetic to the American position, 
most of them just don't want to take sides. And here, I completely agree with Robert Kaplan when he says that Trump has been a gift to China. He has. I mean, when he launched his trade war against China, logically he should have recruited a few allies like the Europeans, like others, to join the United States in a trade war against China. Instead, he also launched a trade war against his own allies. And by alienating so many key allies of the United States, President Trump has, of course, inadvertently increased the amount of geopolitical space for China. Which is why it makes it a very interesting question. Would China prefer to see Trump win again? Or would China prefer to see Biden win? And that's an interesting question I think we can discuss in the Q&A section. But one thing is clear, whether it's Trump, whether it's Biden, this geopolitical contest will continue. And my view is that the vast majority of countries in the world, if they had a choice, if they had a voice, they would all speak out and tell the United States and China, stop. Please don't carry on with this contest. We have far more pressing challenges. And certainly, we are still in the middle of fighting COVID-19. The battle is not over. Let's get together. Let's fight COVID-19. Let's kill COVID-19 before we carry on with our geopolitical contest. And I hope that the rest of the world will come together and give this united message to the United States and China in the hope that this will finally succeed in getting them to think twice before shaking up the world with this geopolitical contest. Thank you. Great opening remarks, and we already have some excellent questions from our viewers, and I have a few questions of my own. Uh, let me start with Robert Kaplan. Robert, welcome to the show. Uh, the, uh, Thank you. You just heard uh, Kishore Mahawani say that his friends in the U.S. need to think about the big picture instead of getting fixated on a series of minor irritations. He is also asserting that the U.S. has allowed or ceded to China significant geopolitical space in recent years because of the strategic error. Your views, please. Yes, well, I, I actually agree with Kishore in terms of the U.S. ceding to China um, geopolitical space, because remember, China's Belt and Road Initiative, with all of its problems, and all of its limitations and, and whatever, you know, the imperfections of it, at least it's a grand strategy, it's a direction, it's something that catches people's imagination, it's something that can be tinkered with and fixed as they go along. Now, the United States did have a counterpart called the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have been an alliance of a military, economic, free trading, democratic trending alliance of like-minded U.S. allies and others eventually. But as soon as President Trump entered the Oval Office in early 2017, he tore it up. Um, so the U.S. has nothing to compete. It doesn't have a grand strategy. It has no vision to offer um, at the moment. And its alliance is, is not, I wouldn't say crumbling. That's too extreme because there's such a, a fear of China in Asia in some places. But just take the Japan-South South Korea trade, uh, trade fight. That would not have happened in previous democratic, uh, in previous presidential administrations, which would have sent an assistant secretary of, of state immediately to the region to conduct shuttle diplomacy. That ha that's just an example of how the alliance, the, the Western alliance in Asia, um, is face is facing real trouble. So we have ceded geopolitical space. I agree with that. But some of the things President Trump is focusing on are not small things like trade disadvantages, China's creeping gradual annexation of the South China Sea. Remember, the South China Sea is an adjacent sea to China. It's half a world away from the United States. But the United States, like it or not, has always considered itself a Pacific power. And that's because of history. World War II in the Pacific, Vietnam, Korea, Commodore Perry opening up Japan, etc., etc. 
Um, let's switch the discussion toward China, and I'll bring in Professor Mahobani here. Uh, Professor, in your latest book, provocatively titled Has China Won?, you argued that both the U.S. and the Chinese have made major strategic errors in recent years. On the U.S. side, and you just talked about it, it's the argument that there has not been a cohesive long-term plan to engage with China. What have been China's strategic error? Well, I think China's biggest strategic error was to alienate its number one friendly constituency in the United States, uh, which was the American business community. And in fact, I devote a whole chapter in my book to explaining how and why it happened. Because frankly, for a long time in the past, for example, the mid-1990s, when President Bill Clinton wanted to pass some measures against China, the American business community immediately said, stop, 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 we, please don't go there. You know, China's got a big market. And, and, and they were always the one force that would prevent any major downturn in U.S.-China relations. But what's significant is that when President Trump finally launched his trade war uh, against China in 2017, 2018, no one spoke up. No one. And I noticed earlier you had uh, Evan Greenberg uh, in your show here. Uh, his father, for example, Hank Greenberg, was one of the biggest uh, spokesmen for saying we needed a good uh, U.S.-China relationship. Today, actually, as I think Robert said in his opening remarks, China has no friends in the United States. Nobody is speaking out at all and saying, hey, let's pause and think about what's going on. So I think the Chinese need to reflect quite deeply on what went wrong. And obviously China made mistakes. There was uh, allegations of stealing of intellectual property, uh, arm twisting to share technology. And frankly, after the 2008-2009 financial crisis, the Chinese officials did become a bit arrogant especially after U.S. Treasury officials went to Beijing and said, please, please, please buy U.S. Treasury bills, and the Chinese thought they had arrived. So I think the Chinese need to also consider, as I said, in any geopolitical contest, both sides have made mistakes, and I think that's where the Chinese made the biggest mistake. Uh, Robert Kaplan, back to you. In uh, 2016, the International Court of The Hague had made a ruling on, a rather ran landmark ruling on territorial claims on South China Sea. It was a rather sensitive one, and the Obama administration sort of neglected it. But last week, the Trump administration officially aligned itself with the ruling and, and basically, you know, very openly challenging China's territorial claim on South China Sea. Now, we've seen a series of escalations in the last couple of years, and especially in recent weeks. How significant is this one? It's very significant, but it's been an organic development because Republican administrations, even if they're conventional Republican administrations, can be expected to be more hardline in these kinds of things than traditional Democratic administrations. Remember, the Obama administration had people at the Pentagon, Ash Carter and others, who wanted a much stronger reaction to China and the South China Sea. It was the president, really, who was saying, no, no, let's not go that far. So what Trump is doing doing in this instance is not really out of the ordinary. It's not wild and crazy. It's just, you know, a tr traditional Republican, more hardline response to China's creeping, you know, a, a thousand micro step uh, annexation of what the Chinese consider their Caribbean. Like I wrote a chapter in a book six years ago, I called the South China Sea, China's Caribbean, that China's views the South China Sea exactly as the United States from the late 19th century through the early decades of the 20th century saw the Caribbean as their adjacent sea that they were going to organically take control of, uh, uh, you know, having settled their continental landmass. So, but here's the problem. The problem is that as both sides dig in their heels on this, the chances of an incident go up. They're still low, but the, you know, it's not a probability, but the possibility goes up from say five to 15% or so that there could be an incident. And if there were an incident in a global media environment, you know, both sides would be, um, you know, obsessed with status 
and not seeming to be the weaker party in this. And therefore, they could escalate rather quickly. Um, remember, we've had wars in Iraq, Syria, Libya. It hasn't affected global markets at all. They easily priced it in. But if we had even like a four-day military conflict in the south or east China Sea between the U.S. and China, you would have, you would have a massive effect on financial markets, I think. Great. You have not only answered my question, but you've also answered my follow-up questions. So I'll just go back to Professor Malwani. Uh, Professor Malwani, I'm going to share with you a quotation from Ian Bremmer of Eurasia Group. He wrote this earlier this week, that China's international escalations increasingly look like weakness alongside risk acceptant behavior from a leadership that is under more pressure than they have been over the course of their tenure. What's your view about that? Well, uh, let me just make a quick comment on uh, South China sure. Sea. And I completely agree with Robert when he said if there was any kind of incident in the South China Sea today, it would have a far more devastating effect on markets and the global implications would be enormous. And uh, let me share with you my biggest fear over the next four months. We know that President Trump is trailing in the polls. We know that uh, he's going to have a challenge uh, winning the presidential elections. And sadly, when you're a president and you are in trouble getting reelected, it's good to have a distraction. Sometimes it's good to have a small foreign war, rally the country around you, people rally around the, rally around the flag, and that's how President Trump might try to get elected. So that's, I think, a, a terribly dangerous uh, situation that we should pay very careful attention to. And I hope, Robert, that there'll be some voices uh, in the United States to uh, uh, sort of, in a sense, advocating caution when it comes to dealing with the uh, South China Sea, because Robert is absolutely right. Neither side can afford to be seen to be uh, climbing down. But on your question about whether or not, uh, as my friend Ian Bremer uh, said, that this is a sign of weakness in, in China, I, I can tell you it is possible, okay? We never know what really is going on inside the Chinese government. But let me suggest a different point of view, which is that the present Chinese government may be one of the best governments that China has had in a very long time, and certainly since uh, Deng Xiaoping. And you know, the, you know I, I, I participated in Singapore actually in the launch of something called the Edelman Trust Barometer. And in the results of this Edelman Trust Barometer Global Survey is that the country where you have the highest level of trust in government today is China, with 90% level of trust. And, and Xi Jinping today, I mean, most people don't seem to know this, is actually a very popular leader uh, in, in China because the Chinese people actually like to have a strong leader, and especially one who's, who's taking care of the country. And I can tell you that after... President Trump launched his trade war followed by a technology war. Even the members of the establishment who had some reservations about Xi Jinping removing the term limits, for example, but they actually coalesce around him and say, no, no, this is where China needs a strong leader. And frankly, I'm actually glad that China has a strong leader now because if the United States makes some moves that are dangerous and inflammatory, you actually need a very, very strong leader not to react equally strongly. You need a strong leader to hold back and say, no, we will not respond uh, to this uh, provocation. So in that sense, I think we, we must give some credit where it's due and we must give Xi Jinping some credit for saying, OK, I will still be measured and restrained uh, in my response in, responses in these areas. Uh, Robert Kaplan, in uh, his book, Kishore Mahobani, warns that weaponizing the dollar uh, could be a very dangerous move by the U.S. against the Chinese, and it could actually come back and harm the U.S. How far do you think the U.S. would go in this path? Um, well, I hope it wouldn't go very far, because one of the many reasons the U.S. dollar is the reserve currency in the world is because the U.S., because the people always trust the United States and its political situation more than they have trusted Europe or Asia or China. And a provocative move to, to weaponize currency would downgrade the trust in the United States. And that could have effect over the middle and long term on the value of the dollar and its 
the reserve currency. Remember, the reason it's the reserve currency is people feel safer investing in the U.S. Uh, Europe is more unwieldy. It's a bit more unpredictable. China's authoritarian. It's not quite there yet. And so there's nobody, no other major power with the capacity so that the currency remains the world's reserve currency. But this is not forever, perhaps. And, it, and it's caveated by that the United States has to act responsibly in this. Um, going back to something Kishore said before, Kishore said before was that um, there, unfortunately, there are no voices calling for more moderation against China in the United States because guess what? This is an election campaign. And the Democrats have decided that they want to get to the right of President Trump and be even as aggressive or more aggressive towards China than he is. So we're in a dangerous period up until the election. After there's a winner in the election, even if it's President Trump, you know, he would ramp down the pressure on China, perhaps, because he wouldn't need to have it ramped up to get reelected because he's already done that. And I think what the Democrats would do is they would lower the temperature. They would get back to a more stable, predictable, but hard relationship because the Democrats would be tougher on human rights than, than the Republicans are. Robert, I want to stay with you for a moment. Uh, there's a question from a viewer uh, that, you know, you had earlier said in your opening remarks that you have a pretty good sense of the administration officials who will be part of a uh, Biden team. Uh, who will be in charge of China and the State Department and these personalities? What's your sense of the way they will advise? Well, Biden? I can't tell you exactly, because in Washington, uh, there are always surprises and, you know, and people almost never get the jobs they want. They always settle for something less, so to speak. But the major figures, the China experts in the mod or Asia experts in the moderate wing of the Democratic Party are well known. Um, there, you know, some are very well known, like Kurt Campbell, former uh, Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia. Some are lesser well known, like Eli Ratner, who worked for Joe Biden uh, as a Deputy National Security Advisor when Biden was was Vice President, and he is he is an Asia specialist. Um, there are quite a few others. The Defense Secretary would likely be Michelle Flournoy. Um, I have to say, uh, you know, uh, to uh, a disclosure these are all my former colleagues um, so uh, so I, I I know them all and their basic attitude is they want to like draw parameters around the US China dispute and make you know and set rules and regulations so it doesn't get out of hand but within those parameters they will be very very tough there will there probably is no going back to the pre-trump U.S. relationship with China, because as I said several times, China has no friends left in Washington, uh, really. It's alienated the media, the elite media, because of the repression of the Uyghur Turks, what they've done in Hong Kong, and they're ramping up, uh, you know, a they're ramping up pressure on Taiwan. So it, a, a democratic administration would be a little bit back to normal, but not fully back to normal, as in like the Obama or George W. Bush era. China has no le friends left in Washington. Professor Mahobani, how many friends does China have left in Asia? We have seen in recent months, you know, pro provocations against India. There is perennial issues vis-a-vis -vis Korea and Japan. Uh, where, where is China going with all this? Well, I mean, certainly... China doesn't have the kind of deep old friends and allies like the ones that United States has had in Europe, in Japan, and, and, and South Korea. And the question is, is that how China is going to conduct its relations with the rest of the world? And I think China is not going to try and copy what the United States did. It's not going to try and create a global alliance system. Because that's not the goal of the Chinese. The Chinese don't have a strategic goal to take over the world, to run the world in the way that the United States believe it had a mission to save the world. China doesn't believe it has a mission to save the world. China's main goal, even to today, 
is to overcome the century of humiliation that China suffered from 1842 to 1949 to become very, very strong and very, very powerful so that no one tramples on it. And at the same time, make sure that it continues to have a strong and dynamic economy. And how does China have a strong and dynamic economy? And I can tell you, for those of you who haven't read Xi Jinping's speech in Davos in January 2017, it's worth reading very carefully because he made a very important point in that speech. He said, why did China fall backward? Basically, because it built walls and cut itself from the rest of the world. What is China going to do today in the future? He says China must jump into the choppy sea of globalization. And when we jump into the choppy sea of globalization, we drank water, we struggled. But at the end of the day, we became much stronger swimmers. And today we can take on the challenges of uh, globalization. And today, the big difference within China and the United States is that, paradoxically, it was the United States that launched globalization in the world, and China re actually rejected it initially. And today, the United States is, as, as Robert says, walking away from TPP and other things. The United States is frightened of globalization, frightened of losing jobs to globalization. China is actually very confident and believes it can, it can do very well in uh, globalization. So China's approach, therefore, is not to look for friends but to look for economic partners with whom it can, it can grow and develop. And, 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 and these need not be friends. So, for example, Japan is clearly not a friend of uh, China by any definition. But guess uh, who's, uh, who's the largest trading partner, uh, one of the largest trading partners of Japan? is China. So that's how Ch China is going to operate. And, 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 of course, Robert also earlier put his finger on it when he talked about the Belt and Road Initiative being part of a very carefully thought out long-term strategy. And guess what? Out of 193 countries in the world, over 120 countries have joined uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, they're not going to be friends of China, but they're going to work with China. So the model with which China operates in the global environment will be very different from the American model, but it will work for China, and I would say China's growth uh, rate of influence and, and, in a sense, power in the world will grow, and that's a reality. Uh, Robert Kaplan, I'm going to take one more question from the viewers. Uh, the question is about the risk of conflict Clearly, both you and Kishore Mahabani think that the risk of direct confrontation between the U.S. and the Chinese are fairly small. But what about proxy wars? Um, well, there certainly will be proxy battles for influence around the world. Uh, the Chinese are very interested in Iran, not because it's a fellow to, uh, authoritarian state, but because Iran is the demographic, geographical, economic organizing principle at the junction of the Middle East and Central Asia. Even if Iran was democratic, China would be just as interested in it so to speak. So there's going to be a competition for the U for U.S., China, Iran, especially if there's a Democratic president um, after November who will want to uh, improve U.S. relations with Iran. Um, the Chinese and the United States will compete for the affections of the Vietnamese and others. Um, uh, remember, China is in Asia. It is the organizing principle of Asia. <clears throat> the U.S. is half a world away, so that even American allies have to get in Asia have to get along with China. They face no; they have no other choice. So the U.S. really has to offer them something, a vision, or something, or else they're going to eventually drift. And that is where you won't have proxy wars, but you will have proxy diplomatic and other forms of competition. Um, I don't see the Chinese getting involved in an aggressive military way in the way that the Russians have in Syria or the way the Iranians have in Yemen. That I don't see with China. China uses its military in a maritime trading sense. You know, it's built a, poor, uh, a military base in Djibouti at the choke point of the Red Sea. I think it has its eye on a military base in western, uh, western Pakistan near the Iranian border next to Gwadar, again near the entrance point of the Persian Gulf. Uh, China sees, you know, military and trade and naval all, in, all together in that sense. 
um, whereas the U.S. and the Russians tend to div- separate them out. Professor Mahoney, how does Singapore deal with this issue? <laughs> uh, you, you, you've asked me a very difficult question. Uh, I think Singapore is going to face a very, very challenging environment. As you know, as I predict in my book, the, the, the U.S.-China geopolitical contest will definitely grow. And it's not driven by personalities. As I said in my opening remarks, it's driven by structural forces. And Singapore will be put in a very, very difficult position because in many respects, we are very, very closely tied uh, to the United States, uh, old relationships, political ties, defense ties, economic ties. But we are also, and I, I think Robert emphasized it very well, we are also in Asia. And China is today becoming the number one actor in Asia, without a, without a doubt. And so Singapore really doesn't want to be caught in this contest and doesn't want to choose. And I thought our Prime Minister was actually very brave when he published his essay in Foreign Affairs in this month's issue, July issue of Foreign Affairs, saying, we hope that this contest doesn't get out of control, but we really do not want to be caught in the middle. We want to be friends with the United States. We want to be friends uh, with China. And I think that's the right approach for us to take. But I also want to add, as an as a, uh, as a, as a important realistic point, it's going to be difficult. Well, it's going to be difficult without any question. I had so many questions left for both of you, but unfortunately we've run out of time. Uh, I think we'll have to create an independent webinar with the two of you another day where we can sort of duke it out for a much longer, much thorough way. Uh, thank you very much, Robert Kaplan and Kishore Mahawani, for your time. Uh, thanks to our viewers.